Power. 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 Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But what happens when a company gains such vast power that it becomes untouchable, and failure is not an option regardless of the cost? Our story begins in 1916 in Seattle, when bird-loving college dropout Bill Boeing founded his fledgling seaplane company with boyish dreams of pushing the boundaries of aeronautics. This humble startup would evolve over the coming decades to become a major player in the military-industrial era, with Adolf Hitler and the Emperor of Japan wreaking havoc from the skies. The U.S. was compelled to rapidly enhance its air power to resist the threat, however, as we will see, where there is war. There is also significant political influence. Boeing would use this influence to become not only dominant, but also too powerful and ultimately too insulated from the consequences of its actions to ever fully fail. Eddie Hubbard and I took a flight up to Vancouver, BC. On our return trip, the postmaster at Vancouver handed us a mail sack for delivery to the postmaster at Seattle. This was the first international mail ever carried by plane into the United States. This is how a war profiteer learned to play both sides and why it might continue to persist to this day. In a modest shed on the shores of Lake Union, Bill Boeing tinkered with his ambitions, sketching wing designs by lantern light. The aviation rookie dreamed of soaring amongst the gulls. His maiden effort, a rickety contraption dubbed the B&W, took to the waves in 1916 with Boeing at the controls. Though barely aloft, it proved wings could fly from water, not just land. News of Boeing's experiments with seaplanes began circulating among Seattle locals. Curiosity was piqued by the ambitious amateur aviator and his cobbled together crafts. Then, in 1916, an unexpected opportunity came knocking. Across the Atlantic, a dangerous new conflict was taking to the skies. Fighting planes engaged in deadly dogfights high above the trenches. Recognizing aviation's growing impact, the U.S. Army put out a call seeking scout planes of their own. Most seasoned manufacturers scoffed at such a minor order, but to Boeing, it represented a chance too great to dismiss. Despite lacking the resources and personnel for a large-scale project, Boeing was persistent. He devised a strategy to expand his business through the acquisition of supplies and by licensing the proven designs of British plane maker Vickers. This approach would give Boeing an edge over its competitors. The news that the seaplane man had secured military backing spread quickly throughout Seattle's shipyards. Ordinary laborers rushed to Boeing's door, eager to join the first aeronautical division and be part of this new industry. The workforce quickly grew from just three men to hundreds, who worked tirelessly to meet deadlines at the expanded facilities now called Plant One. Although there were challenges, the launch of planes onto Lake Washington proved that the Model C and its maker were ready to rise to the challenges of war. From humble seaplanes, an aviation giant was taking off. They prospered and exceeded expectations for a while until the war came to an end. In 1918, the conclusion of World War I resulted in a sudden change for Boeing. As the armistice bells rang across Europe, the U.S. Army stopped placing orders, causing a rapid decrease in production. Boeing had been solely focused on producing for war purposes, and now they were at risk of shutting down permanently. In spite of the tumultuous times, Bill Boeing's goal was to expand his product line. He made some modifications to the sturdy Model C, which resulted in the C-700 biplane. This new design set records by delivering mails between Vancouver and Seattle. The plane's successes hinted at the potential of aviation for peacetime pursuits. Alongside this, the PW-9 fighter, which was originally designed for the military, underwent speed trials that exceeded anything before. With a clocking speed of over 150 miles per hour, it shattered speed records at the time. The PW-9 fighter was Boeing's first attempt at crafting a military plane purely for speed. 
Drawing on insights from its wartime designs like the Model C, engineers strive to shave off every ounce of excess weight, and when it finally took to the skies for its maiden trials in 1923, the results were astonishing. Boeing was emboldened by the positive response to their research efforts and decided to invest more in it. They developed new designs, including the Model 15 mail plane and the pioneering monomail, which pushed technological boundaries. Despite these innovations, they struggled to secure funding as there were no wealthy buyers interested in their products. In the early days, people were hesitant to fly, so the aviation industry relied heavily on military support. Boeing was apprehensive as he observed the worsening global situation. He had built a small empire, catering to the needs of the troops in the past, and if there was another wave of global unrest that affected allies overseas, their air forces might require the specialized skills that his company had developed. In the 1930s, ominous rumblings were emerging from Germany. A madman was rising with the aspiration of dominating Europe through a new type of blitzkrieg warfare. As the war spread across Europe and Asia, no companies were prepared for the huge manufacturing demands that were to follow. Boeing had diversified its offerings in the late 1930s, moving beyond just fighter to bomber jets, massive machines that would soon play a crucial role in determining the fate of nations. Boeing's first bomber, the B-17 Flying Fortress, had taken its maiden flight in 1935, and it had already captured the hearts of many observers due to its impressive 10-engine size. The military was also impressed with its potential, and orders poured in, however, building just a few prototypes proved to be easy compared to the demands of a full-scale war. So, in response to President Roosevelt's urgent call in 1941, American industries mobilized to become the arsenal of democracy. This phrase was first used by U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt in a radio broadcast on December 29, 1940, almost a year before the United States entered the Second World War, to address the threat to national security. During the Second World War, Boeing experienced a significant expansion in its workforce, with thousands of riveters, sparkers, and engineers employed in multiple plants across Seattle and beyond. Each plant was dedicated to a specific plane component, and the factories operated around the clock to produce B-17S and later B-29S by 1944, over 350 planes were produced each month, making up a third of the global air power used in the war effort. Although the founder of the company, Bill Boeing, had passed away, his legacy lived on, and the company became a giant in the aviation industry. It played a crucial role in streamlining the wartime manufacturing process, contributing more than any other manufacturer in the fight against fascism from the skies. However, the company faced even greater challenges in maintaining its dominance in the aviation industry after the war ended. Towards the end of 1945, Boeing's war production, which had sustained the company for years, came to an abrupt halt as the war ended. This left hundreds of factories nearly empty and tens of thousands of jobs lost. To survive in the post-war economy, the company knew they had to reinvent themselves once again. Luckily, the rise of Cold War tensions with the Soviet threat meant that military contracts continued to provide a stable revenue stream. However, Boeing wanted to expand into the commercial airline industry, which posed serious challenges. Their initial attempts, such as the hybrid piston engine Stratocruiser, failed to impress passengers who yearned for the sleek modernity pioneered by foreign jet programs. Meanwhile, competitors like Douglas and Lockheed took early advantages, and Boeing's market share began to slip. As despair crept through the boardrooms, a new leader, Bill Allen, took the helm. Although he had worked in the shadow of the company founders for years, he saw an opportunity in the new era of jet power and worked to bring Boeing back from the brink of failure. Under Allen's leadership, Boeing directed its engineering expertise and factory networks toward a risky endeavor. Allen urged engineers to design the 707, a swift high-wing passenger jet that could potentially outpace competitors' planes. However, they soon realized that the biggest challenge would be getting it off the ground. By 1954, a prototype was ready for its inaugural flight, generating great excitement, however, perfecting systems like high-altitude pressurization and obtaining civil certification 
proved to be a daunting task. Despite the challenges faced by the 707 programs, it ultimately emerged victorious. When the sleek airliner made its debut during the jet age in 1958, it received widespread admiration and secured over 900 orders, thus cementing Boeing's dominance in the industry. Although the company's profits soared as a result, the process of scaling up production across expanded factories proved to be a strain on resources. And so, to maximize efficiency, Allen devised strategic partnerships and outsourced various aspects of the operation. Once in service, the 707 played a significant role in kickstarting the jet age, allowing for mass air travel by 1960, annual passenger numbers surpassed all previous years combined, leaving rivals such as Douglas and Lockheed scrambling to keep up. However, Boeing's first mover advantage had already been secured, ensuring the company's position at the forefront of commercial aviation for many years to come. Nevertheless, new challenges would continue to arise due to changing technologies and geopolitics. By the early 2000s, Boeing's hold on power seemed as secure as ever. With the Cold War a fading memory, its factories churned out massive airliners like the 747 and lucrative military projects like the V-22 Osprey. However, chinks were beginning to show in the company's armor. A series of leadership missteps and engineering failures tarnished Boeing's once sterling reputation, and the 787 Dreamliner program faced production issues and outsourcing problems, causing years of delay that threatened Boeing's commercial dominance. In addition, two fatal crashes of the 737 MAX revealed negligent design practices and cozy relationships between Boeing and regulators. And Boeing issues piling up after an audit by U.S. aviation authorities revealed dozens of problems. After investigations into two deadly air crashes, it was revealed that Boeing had a culture that prioritized speed and cost cutting over safety and accountability. The company was forced to pay billions of dollars in fines and compensation to the victims' families and faced public scrutiny. Several family members of the victims of Boeing's deadly 737 MAX crashes testified on Capitol Hill today for the first time. A total of 346 people were killed in the two crashes in Indonesia and Ethiopia. Those incidents led to the grounding of 737 MAX airplanes worldwide. The company's political influence was also weakened, as it could no longer rely on unanimous support in Congress. Even though Boeing was once a dominant force, it learned the hard way about the dangers of unchecked power and lack of transparency. Since then, the company has been taking steps to regain the public's trust, and only time will tell if it will be successful. That's it for today's video. We'd love to know your thoughts on this issue in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Your support helps us reach more people with our content. Thank you for watching, and consider watching our other videos right here.